go to our last item on our uh, thing, which is we will introduce our guest speaker tonight that you probably already know is uh, James Perilla, our executive director, who will be lecturing on the battles of Saratoga and the common soldier. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, and thank you for four years of leadership. Um, which I, put, I tried to chain him, but he wouldn't. I tried to chain him here and keep him in the office, but he said no. <laughs> All right, folks. So, um, what we're going to talk about tonight in our present or my presentation is going to be about the battles of Saratoga, and this is going to be in a way where I'm going to give you all a basic history of the Saratoga campaign. I believe that as um, historians or lovers of history, many of us probably know it, but I'm going to go through some of the basics just to reiterate things or bring up refresh memories from long ago. And then I'll talk about the soldiers themselves, the equipment that I have, what I'm wearing and what's here on the table. But also I want to make special note that one of our museum members, uh, Charlie Wheeler, he's sitting right here in the back of the room. Everything that on that table is his personal collection um, of artifacts, of um, weaponry, um, and especially there's one musket in there that was actually used at the Battle of Saratoga. So after we're done, I'm done speaking, I highly encourage you to come up to visit um, with me. I'll talk, I can show you some of the equipment um, closer up or uh, visit with Charlie also. And Charlie, thank you so much for taking the time to bring that in today. <laughs> pull up my PowerPoint as you're staring at an image of the Battle of Saratoga by Don Troiani. And, and I don't use the PowerPoint very much, really, in a presentation. Um, not to, I kind of say when I'm dressed like this, I am my own PowerPoint. <laughs> uh, it's kind of true. And I'm not like a normal speaker. A normal speaker uses a laser pointer. I'm going to use a ramrod. All right, so the Battles of Saratoga and the Common Soldier. Well, you know, I've, I've worked here at the History Museum for almost 25 years, um, but I actually got my start way back in the 1980s as a volunteer at Saratoga National Historical Park, or Saratoga Battlefield. So my honest and true love really is 18th century military history. I worked there for almost 10 years, um, and I did living history and educational programming, So when I, and I still do um, um, reenactments and living history. So it's kind of a passion for me. So today I'm happy to talk about the Battle of Saratoga. Um, and the painting you see there, that's the on Trumbull painting of the battles um, and the surrender in the village of Schuylerville, which in the 18th century was called Saratoga. Remember, we didn't exist over here yet. We were called the Springs near Saratoga. So the battles of Saratoga were 1777. Right? This was three years into the American Revolution. Um, just as a quick recap about what had been going on, the war started in 1775. Um, battles of Lexington and Concord with um, the Minutemen attacking the, um, the British column that was marching to get to, um, to procure American supplies and take them, uh, take them from them. So, um, we had the Battle of Bunker Hill, which was, seemed to be another um, American victory. Then there was um, devastating American losses, the Battle of Long um, George Washington himself lost New York City, um, which turned out to be a very difficult um, position to hold. But all of this was putting um, the American army um, kind of into a, st a strained position. The Continental Congress was fairly ineffective at properly outfitting and um, coordinating an army that they had just constructed or just thought up and um, developed. Um, states. Individual states had their own um, militaries, there were local militias, and then the Continentals. Continental, like I am dressed here, that would have been regular US or regular um, American army. They weren't militiamen. Um, and they signed for, for short, period, short enlistments. Uh, sometimes they were, the enlistments were for six months. Sometimes they were for a full year. Some people, um, foolishly enlisted for the duration of the war, thinking it was going to be three, three months to six months. But so the army was seldom outfitted properly. Um, often, they did, often they did not have um, adequate arms. Um, and often enlistments were gonna, be, um, were gonna be up. And all of a sudden George Washington was gonna be without an army within days. And that's where we had the Battle of Trenton when um, Inaccurately, historians said that, well, Washington crossed the Delaware, he attacked a bunch of drunk Germans on Christmas, which was, um, he did cross the Delaware, but that's not accurate whatsoever. And actually was, um, 
the Germans actually had an opportunity to fight back and they did, they, they lost. But that was a strategic victory for him because with enlistment sending, he was able to um, boost everybody's spirits and he had, and he was able to keep his army. Um, but, in spice, um, but after that, things were starting, still kind of going downhill for the Americans. You have the main American army is in the Philadelphia area. That's where George Washington is. There's another army called the Northern Department, and that's up here where we are. We are the Northern Department. And primarily the soldiers that were up here were in the area of Ticonderoga, um, and also in the, right around here in Albany. So. So who are the people that are participating in this um, Battle of Saratoga? Well, there's, um, lot, there's a huge cast of characters, but these are your, your main players here. You got General John Burgoyne. Burgoyne commands the British Army. Burgoyne is a, um, is a very rich gentleman. He's a playwright. Um, he loves to party, and he's very well known in, um, in Parliament. Here we have General Horatio Gates. The American soldiers themselves called him Granny Gates. Um, he was a British officer. During the French and Indian War, he commanded um, troops, but he was a much better adjutant and paper pusher than he ever was a leader. And another guy who plays into a lot of American history is right there, Benedict Arnold. Um, Benedict Arnold is a major player in the Saratoga campaign, and also, and as you know, sold out the plans at West Point a couple of years later and became America's most famous traitor. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about these guys, because there's so many people in the cast of characters, but you've got Burgoyne second in command, um, William Phillips, and I like to point him out because he's wearing a blue coat. We think of the Brits always wearing red, but he's a Royal Artillery General, and a Royal Artillery wore blue. Baron Friedrich von Riedesel. Riedesel um, was a German, he was not a Hessian, he was a Brunswicker. Um, we had a lot of German soldiers fighting with the Brits um, as paid soldiers. The, Brit the Germans themselves were not mercenaries. The princes that sent the soldiers over here were mercenaries. Um, so they got the money for the soldiers. And most of the soldiers at Saratoga were from a province called Brunswick, hence Brunswickers. Next to him, uh, probably one of the better generals the Brits had was Simon Fraser, And he um, plays a big part in the Second Battle of Saratoga. And next to him is Barry St. Leger. It will learn about him in just a minute in the third, in the, the um, three-prong attack um, lesson that we had learned in high school. Down below on the American side, here's the guy that originally commanded the Northern Department, General Philip Schuyler. Schuyler was a, um, a gentleman from New York. He had a, his main home in Albany and his country home was in Saratoga or Schuylerville. And both of those um, homes are still operated. One is a state site and Schuyler House in Schuylerville is a National Park Service site. You've got Benjamin Lincoln, that was um, Gates the second in command. And probably one of the more famous guys right there is Daniel Morgan. Morgan commanded what was known as the Rifle Corps. Um, and he it was a special elite regiment of soldiers that fought with rifles, not with muskets. And as we go on, I'll explain that as I have both a rifle and a musket here. And the very last guy on the end, um, that is James Wilkinson. Um, the only reason I really talk about him, he was Gates' adjutant, he was a rabble rouser, he caused trouble. Um, all through um, these armies, um, you had more political infighting than anything else. And if um, we ever made a movie about the Battle of Saratoga, Danny DeVito should play him. Because that's, that's what he reminds me of. And there's one picture I did not put up here, I forgot him. Uh, probably one of the most important men. Um, today is Kosciusko. We know him, the twin bridges are named after him, or Thaddeus Kosciusko, depending on how you want to pronounce it. He was a Polish engineer, he volunteered to serve in the American army and he was a fantastic military tactician and, and engineer. He's the one that is responsible for why the Americans defended where they did. And also designed other fortified areas as well, like um, Mount, Mount Independence, which is just across Lake Champlain from Fort Ticonderoga. So this is um, the theater in 1777. So the British Army under um, General John Burgoyne are congregating in Saint Jean, um, Quebec, right up here. Um, the, year, the year prior, there was a British incursion into um, the into the Lake Champlain area, and you might have remembered the Battle of Valcour Island that was fought in 1776 on Lake Champlain. Um, a British flotilla was coming down and met with an American Navy commanded by Benedict Arnold. Um, Arnold was successful in slowing that that. Um, 
advanced down enough that the British pulled back and went um, and went back to Canada for the rest of, um, to winter at over over winter. Arnold managed to lose every ship the Americans had. If they weren't sunk in battle, he burnt them so they didn't fall into British hands. Tactically, not always not the best thing you want to do, but he did slow the British down, so it was considered a success, um, and made way for Saratoga. So in 77, Burgoyne is going to do this again. Only now, he comes up with what is known as the three-point plan. Um, or at least we're told it's a three-point plan in school. General Burgoyne is going to advance down the Champlain, Lake George, and Hudson River to get to Albany. That by guy I mentioned before, Barry St. Leger is going to come down here, go to, start at Oswego, and then he's going to go to Albany. Now, the main British army in America is under General Howe, and it's sitting right around Philadelphia. That's where George Washington's holding up. That's the capital of the nation. Um, typically, wars in the 18th century are won when you take the enemy's capital. General Howe had no real inclination to come up here and help General Burgoyne. He's like, why? Why should I do that when I can bag George Washington? Um, Burgoyne always insisted that, well, they, um, Howe's going to come up. I know he's going to come up. Howe was never ordered to. Howe even wrote letters stating, my intent is to bag George Washington. Just to, I'm just summarizing that, but, but that's basically what it was all about. And Burgoyne was in a, um, was in a, a false sense of security. So this campaign starts off in, this, in that spring. The British Army comes down, or this British Army under St. Legere comes down, and just going to summarize quickly on him, they end up trying to lay siege to Fort Stanwix, which is in Rome, New York today. Fort Stanwix um, in the Revolutionary War was called Fort Schuyler, actually. So St. Legere has 2,000 soldiers, um, and he's trying to take out a huge fort. He has no large artillery. Um, so the first thing that's going to um, be his uh, uh, be a crutch for him. So now also there is um, Fort Stanwix has uh, oh maybe a couple thousand American soldiers there, but um, they know that there is a relief force coming. They're coming up from Albany and they're the general and they hear that Benedict Arnold is going to be leading this force to try to siege. Before um, Arnold gets there, um, Saint Leger sends out his loyalists and um, natives. And they are not far from there at Oriskany. They run into the militia, the American militia. And this was, and they end up having the Battle of Oriskany, which was probably the bloodiest hand-to-hand -hand combat um, of any battle in the Revolutionary War, outside of maybe one of the uh, battles in the South. Um, the, and these were loyalists. These, so these are the folks that lived in the Mohawk Valley. They knew the militia in the Mohawk Valley that they were fighting. They, were, they had been neighbors and friends. Um, and it turns out that it, um, it really was an American victory. Um, it was almost a stalemate, but it was enough that it uh, slowed um, St. Legere's advance, and he said, well, if we're gonna have this, there's another relief force that's coming, we're gonna retreat. So all of a sudden, all these 2,000 soldiers here are out of the game, and they go back to Canada. So that leaves pretty much General Burgoyne coming down right here. He leaves Montreal, or excuse me, St. Jean, with um, about 8,000 soldiers, um, and a hundred pieces of artillery. Um, you, you, we think today, you know, you see um, military caravans driving and they're pulling their pulling cannons. These things are pulled by oxen, horses, and men. And they are thousand, a, a big tube weighs 2,000 pounds, or a cannon barrel. Then add all your oak um, carriage and such, it's just immense, immense amount of weight. Um, and now out of these 8,000 men, you've got probably 4,200 <coughs> or so British soldiers. The remainder are German soldiers, um, some loyalists. You've got some Canadian soldiers and Native Americans. So we're going to, um, he's an arrogant man, an extremely arrogant man, and he feels that as he's coming down, he's gonna brush aside every American force that he's gonna meet. Um, the reason he brought so many cannons is he knows he has to take Fort Ticonderoga. Ticonderoga was built in the um, 1750s by the French, and the British made two assaults on it during the French and Indian War. And they were devastated in their first, the first year they tried, but they took it in 1759. The British held it right up until the beginning of the American Revolution. Right after Lexington and Concord, um, the, the, uh, the, the fort was taken by Benedict Arnold and Ethan Allen. Uh, and they basically took it with about 80 men and they found a garrison of about 10 guys along with one captain. And that was it. I mean, the, the garrison didn't even know the American Revolution started. 
and all of a sudden here are these guys knocking on the door saying, hey, it's our fort now. But what, what it did was it gave the Americans all the cannons that were there, and they brought them to, to the siege of Boston. But now this was in American hands, and it's in 1777, we have the northern department of the American army under Schuyler up there, and refortifying all the French outworks, which were very, very large um, breastworks or fortifications around the fort, outside of the walls. So Burgoyne knows, all right, I'm gonna have to take this. So um, on July 3rd, he advances towards Ticonderoga. There's about 2,000 American soldiers there. Um, most of them are stationed out in the old French lines. And if you've ever visited Ticonderoga, when you drive in on the main road, or the entrance road, you'll drive right through those lines, those big, tall earthworks. And those, that large, um, the way they are now, that is how the American army constructed them. It's not the same way the French did, and they were much larger. So you've got 2,000 Americans hiding behind these walls, or waiting, and then you have a, a, a British army that's gonna probe and find out how strong this is gonna be, where are we gonna place our artillery? Burgoyne advances up to it, um, he gets in line, and his troops are about 300 yards from, the, um, French, from these old French lines. And then there's one British soldier. He just kind of walks out of line. He's a sergeant, so nobody thinks anything of it, because sergeants, you know, you carry a little bit of weight, you can do things that maybe they, you think you got in order. He goes up to a tree, goes up to another tree. He's getting a little bit closer and closer. And finally, one American officer uh, looks down at a soldier and he says, Private, rise and shoot that man. So the private stands up, takes a shot, bunk, soldier goes down. Now all of a sudden, everybody in the American line think, oh my gosh, uh, we got the order to fire. And then all of a sudden, three volleys go out and you have three thou or thousands of musket balls flying at the British, and the British are safely out of range. So then the Brits know, well, this is pretty heavily defended, and they just kind of turned around and walked away and went back to their encampment. Um, the Americans went out and picked it to, to find this um, wounded soldier and they find out that he wasn't hit at all by the musket ball, he was intoxicated and he passed out. <laughs> True story. Uh, but in order to take Ty, Burgoyne now knew he had, they had to put cannons um, in a way that they could take the fort. They dragged two, um, we say 12 pound cannons um, up Mount Defiance, which is a mountain just over the um, stream next to Ty, overlooking it. Um, a 12 pound cannon means the ball is 12 pounds. That the tubes, in the, they are in the visitor center at the battlefield, each of the tubes weighs about 2,500 pounds, um, plus the, the oak carriages. Imagine hauling that to a mountaintop with block and tackle, especially wearing these 18th century shoes, which are very slippery. I can't imagine how they did it, other than um, pure willpower. But you put the cannons up there, and you could fire muscle, or cannonballs down into the fort and destroy it. So the Americans withdrew. They went across the lake, right over to Mount Independence. They actually had a bridge, a floating bridge that was um, across Champlain. The Americans were trying to um, outrun the Brits now. So one British force um, is attached to go over there, go to Mount Independence and follow the Americans. So they start following them. They come up, they cross the bridge, they come up into an American artillery position. And they think, wow, we're gonna get cut to pieces when we get up here. They crawl in, or they get into it, and they find that there was four American artillerymen there. Uh, they had found a barrel of rum, and they were passed out drunk. So the British didn't have any resistance, and they walked right through. Um, so this group of Americans that had crossed into Vermont now are going to be trying to come down to Castleton, Vermont, and the other main group of Americans is running down towards Fort Edward. The ones that were in Vermont end up getting um, caught up, the British kept, kept, catch up to them, and they have the Battle of Hubbardton. Um, that's the only major battle fought in Vermont during this war. Um, Hubbardton was a rear guard action where the flying camp, as it's called, or the British light infantry and grenadiers were upon the camp. They got the Americans while they were cooking their breakfast, um, but it was a delaying action enough the Americans were able to get down the road and get to Castleton and keep, and keep going, because they inflicted quite a few casualties on the Brits. On the other column that's going, there's another battle, and that's in Fort Anne. Um, if you, anybody is familiar with the Route 4 corridor, right after you go through the one stoplight in the village of Fort Anne, keep going north on Route 4, on the left there's a small mountain, it's called Battle Hill. It was a very small battle, but it was between one British regiment and two American regiments. And on the, in that battle, it was not your, your typical 18th century linear combat. This was pitched tree to tree, of British soldiers fighting behind trees and American soldiers. And it was a good delaying action also because that allowed the rest of the American army to escape and they made it eventually all the way down to Albany. 
So Burgoyne's problem now is that the guy, this guy that commanded the Americans, General Schuyler, Schuyler um, started delaying tactics. So he um, had his men out, and every bridge over a stream, they destroyed it. At any place there was something they could do to harass them, they did, the, the Brits, they did. The roads, the roads really weren't very good in the 18th century. Now imagine you're trying to move 7,000 men down a cruddy road. Um, and, and now here you got Schuyler cutting trees, digging trenches, anything to make their life miserable. A good army in 18th century Europe could move 25 to 30 miles a day. I mean, that's a forced march, but they could do it. In, in America, a good march would be about 15 miles a day. General Burgoyne was reduced to one to two miles a day. Part of it was because he, you know, he was a little, he was arrogant, but he was a little lackluster, figuring we'll just take our time. And part of it was because of Schuyler. But Schuyler's um, problem, even though he did a great job slowing the Brits down, he lost Ticonderoga. And he had enemies in the Continental Congress. And the Congress used this, or his enemies used this to their advantage. And they managed to get him um, re relieved of command for the loss of Ty. Um, and from there, that's how Horatio Gates end up, ends up coming into command. Because when you look at the demographics of the soldiers that are fighting at the Battle of Saratoga, um, you have mostly New, um, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, um, some Connecticut, and very few New York soldiers of the regular army. Off, the regular army um, soldiers did, from these New England states did not want to listen to a New Yorker. Um, he was a Yankee, uh, or they were Yankees and he was a Yorker, two totally different people. Um, so they put the Southern Gates in command, who, lucky for us, there were other generals at Saratoga beside Gates. So Burgoyne is on his way down. He makes it to um, this place called Fort Miller, not too far from north of Schuylerville, and he encamps there for a couple of weeks. He sends um, some of his soldiers um, down, across, down near Schuylerville, and then that's when they hear that, hey, and this, we're in August, and they find out, well, there's um, a bunch of American supplies over in the community of Bennington, Vermont. Or, the, or in the Hampshire Grants, I should say. So he sends a detachment of a thousand, almost a thousand men to um, try to capture these supplies. Now, when you read your history books, they're gonna tell you they were going over there to get horses um, for the dragoons. A dragoon um, is a mounted, infant, or a mounted soldier or cavalry. And Burgoyne had one full regiment of 300 Germans that were dragoons. Well, they didn't have any horses and they were never intended to have horses. Um, so history books always said that's what they were going to do. They were actually going over there to destroy American munitions that were stored there. Um, as as these, this large um, column makes its way over, they're harassed all the way by American militia. And at Bennington, um, actually in Hoosick Falls, New York, where the battle was fought, um, it was utter defeat for, the, for this column. Um, by American militia, actually even, commanded by General John Stark. Uh, they just start destroyed the column. They took 700 prisoners, and it was a huge loss to Burgoyne. And figure he's only got 7,000 men or so going, and he's already lost now 700. That's massive in armies of this time and this size. And it's August. Um, winter's coming. He's trying to get to Albany. It's slow, and now he's like, I just got to do something and hurry it up. So he crosses um, at Schuylerville, uh, crosses the Hudson River, and then he starts his advance towards Albany. Um, now the Americans are in Albany. And they move uh, for, uh, forward a little bit. They have um, fortifications at Cahos, or where Peebles Island is today, and then Stillwater. Um, but this, that guy today, Kosciusko, um, goes to the American officers and says, this is not where you want to defend. Stillwater's flat. Um, there's not a lot. It's, it's, it would really help the Brits if they stayed there. So instead, they went, um, he went up to Bemis Heights, which is um, just above where Saratoga Sod Farm is and where the battlefield is, and he said, fortify these heights. So they fortified them, they put 22 cannons on those heights, and the river road ran right underneath it. So there was no, and they, it, it was in, well in range of any cannons. So there's no way um, the British Army could get by there without having to assault them. So um, finally, on September 19th of 1777, that's when our, the, the actual Battle of Saratoga occurs. And there had been fighting all the way up and down on both sides, but that's when the real battles had started. That's a German Dragoon. Sorry, I meant to show you that before. All right, so the Battle of Freeman's Farm is the first Battle of Saratoga, 1777, September 19th. The Americans number about 8,000 soldiers, um, almost all American regulars, Continentals like I'm dressed as. The militia um, did not arrive yet. 
So Bemis Heights is the area where they fortified. Basically, they just started by fortifying this. And then you have General Burgoyne coming down the river road. He knows there's high ground down here. Their scouts have told them there's, there's Americans here, but they don't know exactly where. So he breaks his army into three columns. One column stays on the river. That's all German soldiers under Redesel. Second column comes right up the center under um, Brigadier Hamilton of the 21st Regiment. And General Burgoyne himself personally rode with that regiment. Um, the flying camp under General Frazier, their objective is to come all the way around and try to figure out how to outflank this American position. But they get about to where the visitor center is today, is Saratoga Battlefield. Um, what, we, what we say is that, or we've heard, I don't know how accurate all of this is, it says that um, scouts come back to report the General Gates at about noon in, on that morning. And he said, um, General Wilkinson said, General Gates, sir, I believe they offer you battle. So he said, order out Morgan to begin the game. So he sends out um, Colonel Morgan, the rifle company, all mixed in with about 300 American um, Continentals who were called light infantry because rifles did not have a bayonet. Um, muskets fit a bayonet, and I'll explain that in a minute. So the battle begins um, with these riflemen hitting the British that are walking through a, uh, this guy's farm field, John Freeman, who had just left his farm and now is a loyal soldier fighting with Burgoyne. Um, if this was a pitched battle that he sawed back and forth across this field for six hours. Um, they, you, we had times when the American Continentals were fully drawn up in line. We had times when the British Army was in the woods fighting tree to tree. Um, this, this is an image of one British regiment later in, the, um, later in the afternoon, written ready to advance in against a New Hampshire regiment. And you've got this one, this regiment is out the 62nd. Just giving you an idea how devastating this day was, this, this regiment started the battle with about 380 men. They walked out with 60. Um, not say they were all killed, but to have 60 effectives left is just unheard of in 18th century warfare. And you've got British artillery in here. You can see the blue uniforms. The American riflemen, their main job that, during that day, shoot the artillerymen and shoot the officers, which um, shooting officers was unheard of in the 18th century. It was ungentlemanlike. Well, in the end of the day, um, all that saves the British is that the Germans heard, you know, heard the firing down in the, um, up in the fields, and it took them all day long to um, get up there, but they eventually outflanked the Americans. Americans pull back, and they go back to be their fortifications a mile south, and the British held the field of battle. So in 18th century terms, they held the field of battle, they won. The Americans, they inflicted more casualties, we won. Um, in any case, it, what it does is starts a three month or a three week interlude where we have um, both armies digging in heavily. The Americans um, completely fortified all those heights. We had, um, and now the arrival of thousands of militia, mostly the Albany County militia, I think full 17 regiments of them. And then we have the British building their fortifications. So. It's October, 7, October 6th, 1777. Burgoyne has a council of war, and he's, he's like, we gotta go, guys. We're running out of supplies, which is, was really true. They were already down, I think, quarter rations. So they were gonna try to break through and push to Albany. So Burgoyne um, sends out a detachment the next morning, and they're just trying to probe, still trying to get to this high ground here. They get out to a place, uh, which we call it today Barber Wheat Field. It was actually, it was a, um, it was a wheat field where the small, with um, a small farm, it was not the Barber family um, that owned it. But the, the British are in there cutting the wheat because they needed supplies, and then same thing happened. The Americans fall upon them, they push them back to where they were encamped, and their fortifications. We called it um, the Balcaris Redoubt because it was commanded by a guy named Balcaris. The name Redoubt, there's this picture I'll show you. This is the American assaulting it. A redoubt is a fortification. Um, this one was about 14 feet tall in places with earthen logs on top of it. So the Americans kept coming and coming at this as the, as the Brits um, retreated into it and they got cut to pieces. Um, couple characters in this, um, Benedict Arnold, he and Gates did not get along whatsoever. Arnold was a hothead, Gates um, was pompous, and Wilkinson stirred the pot. So uh, Gate, um, Arnold had been relieved of his command before this because of a, dis, um, a disagreement with Gates. 
And Arnold, um, we believe, rode out into the battle without orders because he had been relieved of command. And the men, you know, they saw him. And they're like, oh, here, here's the general. We're going to follow him. And they just kept following him as he assaulted this and assaulted it. There was another position right near it, which was held by the Germans. Um, Arnold saw that um, another Brit American group was going in to try to take that. He joined them. And that was um, called the Bremen Redoubt. Bremen Redoubt was nothing like this. All this was was a flimsy log wall. It's all shale where this thing is. They couldn't dig in. Um, they went in around behind it. Arnold is shot in the leg, and his, hor uh, his horse is shot and killed. Um, so Arnold's down, and he's wounded. And the Germans are, were quickly, quickly overrun. Um, and by now, it is getting dark out. And that's pretty much the end of the Second Battle of Saratoga. Brit the, all the British pull back to, um, about a half mile north to the river fortifications, and the one general I mentioned earlier, Frazier, he was shot during the Battle of Barber's Wheatfield, and he died the next morning because he had um, an abdominal wound. Doctors said that he ate, um, if he hadn't had a big breakfast that morning, he would have been fine. But I don't know. So this is an um, engraving from that period, and it actually shows the burial of Frazier on one of the mountain or one of the mounds or hills, um, up right at the um, on the Hudson River. The British camp there, then they head back, then they say, we gotta retreat, we gotta try to get back to um, Canada for the winter. They get 10 miles, or seven miles north to Schuylerville, or Saratoga, and that's when we have the siege of Saratoga in 1777. 10 days of it. Um, anybody here that's local, you'll know most of these locations. This is where, if you go hiking by the Saratoga Battle Monument, the Battle Monument's right here. And this is where the hiking trail is through the British woods. And you can see a lot of fortifications still in there. Um, the line over there that are all Germans, that's where our high school is. Um, this is right down one of the main streets. And there's the Schuyler House. And this was all American soldiers. Um, basically, General Burgoyne's troops were completely surrounded. This American army that had about 7,000 now swelled to somewhere between 13 to 17,000 soldiers. Um, most of them were militia, but at this point, they're not going to lose. So on October, 7th, uh, on October 17th, um, Burgoyne surrenders. Um, and he signs what's called the Convention of Saratoga. And in the convention, um, it's not a capitulation, just a convention. He's agreeing, all right, we're going to surrender. Um, you can take our arms. Um, the men keep their personal gear. And um, we'll march us to um, Boston, or Boston, put us on boats, and we'll go back to England and not come back. And Gates like, all right. So um, Continental Congress sees this, and they're like, oh, heck, no way. We're not, we're, and they, so they revoked it. Um, and they uh, fully interred the British soldiers. Many of the officers were paroled. Um, but you know that's why we have Charlie's musket that's back here on the table. That was carried by a soldier in the 21st Regiment of Foot. It was surrendered at Saratoga, and it went to a Massachusetts militia soldier. So um, it was a way to um, help equip us. But it was um, the first time in modern history that a British army openly surrendered in the field. Um, and the thing that made this so important is that if the British did not come in on our side, or I mean, I'm sorry, if the, we did not win, the French would not have come in on our side during the Revolutionary War. Um, this was, was enough for um, Benjamin Franklin, who was over in um, Paris, trying to uh, win the French over, and he did because of this. So now not, we were already getting uniforms and arms um, secretly from France, but now um, here comes the French Navy and the French Army, and you know without them we did not we would not have won the American Revolution. So that's a, about a two-hour talk. I just did really quickly right there because I want to be able to talk about my uniforms. But oh, I'm not done. <laughs> um, so and I refer to uh, what I've got here and what I'm wearing and such. I am dressed as a Continental soldier um, of the 6th Massachusetts Regiment. And when I say 6th Mass, that was Alden's regiment. It was one fighting um, in General Learned's brigade here at the Battle of Saratoga. Um, and mo many of the soldiers at Saratoga were well uniformed. Um, we had recently gotten um, coats that came in from France. They came, um, and also friend, many French arms. So we, we know the New Hampshire, the Massachusetts, and the New York troops did have uniforms. Didn't mean they, it didn't mean they were quality uniforms. Things wore out pretty quickly, too. Um, and the arms are generally French style. Uh, everything that I'm wearing is made of wool or linen. Um, and that's pretty much all they had. Their cotton was a very expensive fabric. You could get it. Um, a wealthy gentleman might have it, but otherwise the regular army soldiers would not have had that. 
Um, why is my coat brown and not blue? Is a good question, but uh, if this uh, brown was a color that many came in. Um, when we, I showed you a picture, let's see if I can just go back to that. If you look at, no, James. If you see that American army or regiment right there climbing up, that's the second New Hampshire regiment. They're wearing sky blue coats, um, which is a French blue. Which, um, so you would have seen brown coats, blue coats. Um, in rare occasions, you even saw Americans wearing red coats, which yes, it, it led to a lot of confusion. Um, some, if, if Americans were able to capture British regimental coats, they would dye them, relieving all the regimental lace and all this stuff right on it, and they usually dyed them brown, because brown would take. So this has absolutely zero to do with camouflage. It had everything to do with um, just the color of the wool that came in. Uh, and everything else I'm wearing, they're called small clothes. These are wool, they could be linen um, if it was summertime. Uh, the American soldiers, you know, they were happy to have a full set that, uh, that worked for them anyway. And 18th century clothing is not comfortable by our standards. Um, if you notice, I can't really move my arms any wider than that. Um, if, it, if it's skin tight, and that was just the style of the time period. In my British uniform here, it actually fits me even tighter than this one does. And that's what everybody wore, so why not? Um, Hat-wise, I'm just wearing a, a, a small round hat. Sometimes you would see tricorn hats, cocked hats, um, hats that are turned up on a side, maybe with a bucktail in it. Um, some regiments perfectly outfitted, others not so much. On the British side, um, British private soldiers did not wear bright red or scarlet. They wore this dark color, it's called matter red. And that is dyed from the matter root, um, which is kind of an orangey color root. Um, every regiment would have a different, uh, regiments had different facing colors. It's decorative. Um, this regiment, which I represent here, would be the 24th Regiment of Foot. They wore, we know they wore green right up until the 1880s or so. If anybody here ever saw the movie Zulu, and you see them wearing green, it's these guys. Um, but you would see them in white and blue and different, um, different combinations. The striping around the buttons, that means he's a private. And also, every regiment had a different striping color. Uh, British, the British Army really tried to decorate up their, their uniforms. And the Americans would have done it also if they had the, the finances and the materials to do it. Um, you can see some fancy materials I have here. I've got a buckle, a brass buckle that says 24. And even in my cartridge pouch, there's a, there's a badge on the back that says 24th Regiment. And these are all pieces that were copied from um, items that were dropped at Saratoga by soldiers. Um, other things that the soldier carried, there's a tin, a tin water flask. Um, we call them canteens today, but they did call them a water flask. Um, you would also see wood ones, copper, um, but most common was tin because it was an easy material to work with. And a soldier also had a pouch called a haversack. And that was something that was strictly military, um, American and British Army. And that's where they would carry their provisions when they're on the march. Provision might be whatever, if, say they're gonna go out on a scout for four days, they're gonna draw enough dried beef, peas, um, and, and maybe flour, or hopefully if it's already cooked, some bread that they can bring with them. So the two armies were very, very similar in most respects. Let, let it be um, command, um, fighting, clothing, one thing the British Army did with Burgoyne, now this regiment would have worn a regular tricorn hat, but since the British Army did not um, receive its allotment of new uniforms between 76 and 77, um, they, cut their uni their, they cut their coats down short so they could patch the holes in them, and they cut their caps down like this to look like um, skirmishers or light infantry soldiers. Every British regiment had a different color horsehair on their hat. Um, and we know ours was green, some were white, um, and we know there was a lot of angry farmers in Quebec because when they, um, the guys were going around cutting horse hair, cutting cow tails, anything they could to get the hair for their hats. <laughs> and that that's well, was well documented. The, uh, Burgoyne had to actually pay some farmers off because they were upset. <laughs> now, <clears throat> I'm, lastly, what I'll do is just talk to you about the difference between the, the weapons that were carried in the 18th century. This one right here is a brown best musket. This is what would have been carried by the Americans, uh, Br uh, British. Americans would also have French muskets and all, but the, the style of, mu of weapon, a musket, was the preferred combat weapon of every army in the 18th century. It is very heavy. It's about, um, this one's about 10, 11 pounds. It's smooth bore, which means there's no rifling in here. And it's a flintlock. So I'm, I'm gonna put this down for a sec. I'll just talk loud. 
So with the flint lock, you guys have three pieces. You have a lock, your stock, right here, and your barrel. That's where that comes, that curve comes from. <laughs> yeah, I, I can easily do that. Um, and being flint lock, there's a piece of flint right here, which is stone, obviously, and a hardened piece of steel. And this is the mechanism that fires the gun. If I was to fire this, whether I'm an American or a British soldier, I'd be wearing this cartridge box right here on my shoulder. I pull out a cartridge. And a cartridge is just a tube of paper with a musket ball embedded or sitting at the bottom of it, gunpowder on top of it. Pull a cartridge out as we're sitting and I'm waiting for the command to prime. So, got the cartridge, I bite the top off the paper, pour a little bit of gunpowder right here in this flash pan. I'll get the command to cast it out, we'll shut that, bring it down. They'll say charge with cartridge, and I stuff the ball, um, pour, pour the powder down, stuff the ball in, still inside that paper. Then I will be told to withdraw a rammer and ram down with charge, ram cartridge. And I do that. It has to be firmly seated. If the ball does not go to the bottom of the barrel, um, the, you can blow your um, barrel when you fire. They return the rammer, and all this takes about 20 seconds um, if it's a well trained unit. And there's just, in, in battle, they, all they say is prime and load. One command, prime and load, and you go through and do that. Um, your firing commands are, are pretty simple. It'd be make ready. You might hear, sometimes you might hear the word take aim in some of the American drills, then present and fire. And when I fire, I don't know if you'll be able to see it or not. I don't know if anybody can see the sparks there. But that's, those sparks fall into this powder, theoretically setting it on fire, going through the vent, and then setting the gun off. And I say theoretically because the wind can blow the sparks away, um, moisture can dampen the powder. You want a good weather to fight in. And the main terror weapon of the 18th century was this, the bayonet. And it's a triangular weapon, creates a wound, will not heal. If you take a bayonet and like this in the 18th century, um, you're probably going to um, get infected and pass away. I actually, I had a buddy at a reenactment a number of years ago. He had his bayonet in his scabbard. He knelt down, you know, right down into his um, calf. So he had to, when he went to the hospital, he actually brought the bayonet with him to show the, <laughs> to show the um, nurses and the doctors. They used him as a teaching case because they, they had never seen anything like it. And they actually they, um, treated it the same way they would in the 18th century. They had to pack it from the inside a little bit out, a little bit at a time until it finally healed inside out. So it's a, a nasty weapon. If the Americans had them, um, when the Americans had them, so they, were, they could counter the British bayonet charges, but not every American regiment you know, would, have a, would have these. So if you saw you know, a, a regiment of 500 men coming in like this, something that you know is going to um, cause some serious injury, you're not going to stay there. You're going to break and run. The entire idea of 18th century warfare is make the other guys break and run. Um, you, you, didn't, you didn't care if you killed a thousand men, you just wanted to break them and hold the field. Um, it was almost like a chess game in some respects. Um, not to belittle it because there was, uh, there was some brutal brutal hand-to-hand -hand fighting in all these battles, but um, it was something that we or would not. Weapon, I'll show you. This is a rifle. And this, there weren't, this is a Pennsylvania long rifle. Um, it's a reproduction that I own. And this was what Daniel Morgan's riflemen would have carried. And these were mostly backwoodsmen from Virginia and Maryland and some from Pennsylvania. And the rifle loads the exact same way as a musket, except it's got spiral grooves in the barrel. So when the ball comes out of this, it's going to spin and be extremely accurate. When the ball comes out of that, it bounces all over the place. You don't know where it's going to go. So that, you're, you're accurate up to about 50 to 75 yards, this 100 yards. Yeah, but this takes over a minute to load because it's a very tight fit. You're like really having to ram your cart, your, your round down. Well, with that, you just drop it down in. Um, and you cannot put a bayonet on a rifle, which was a big disadvantage for the rifle. You know, one time the Continental Congress came up with this really stupid plan where the rifleman would carry this giant four-piece spear on their back. So if the British bayonets were coming, the rifleman had to put their muscles, their rifles down, pull out the spear, put it together, and then get ready to face a charge. Um, it was stupid. But, <laughs> so instead, um, like at Saratoga, they mixed them with the American light infantry. So the Americans would protect the riflemen. Um, and riflemen, you would see them in uniforms. You'd also see them in just linen frocks. You didn't see buckskin shirts and stuff. That's Hollywood. So that's about four different presentations, honestly, 
you're um, mixed into one. Um, so I'm going to ask if anybody has any questions about anything. Yes? Um, one of the things might be faulty, but anyway, at that, at that time, um, how many of the totality of the colonists um, actually were fighting the British since we were not Americans then? I, I, was, it, was it favorable? Did most people want it? There was the way what we've always described when I when I was doing interpretation of this. We said it was like a piece of pie. One third were patriots, one third um, were loyalists, and one third didn't care. They were just going to wait wait around and see who won. Um, yeah. So yeah, it was it was not that everybody had to fight the British or everybody was a loyalist. Our area around here um, was very heavily loyalist, and especially the Mohawk Valley, extremely heavy, heavily. So we have a small number like that too, and then, then like you said, without the help of the French and yes, we probably Right, we didn't, we didn't have the supplies. Um, those, most of the weapons came from England or Europe. Chris? Yeah, you mentioned the Battle of Whiskey, and I know yeah. that involved Iroquois and Bolsa. Yes. You got real bloody, mm -hmm. but I know Burgoyne brought Native Americans down from Canada, mm -hmm. and they did raids. At what point did they, they weren't in the main battle. No, Burgoyne initially had a bunch of, I don't know, I think about 100 um, Native warriors, mostly from Canada. Um, and I think they're um, primarily Mohawk, might have been Sabinaki too. They, there was an incident um, just in Fort Edward with a young girl named Jane McCray. Okay, so Jane, um, she was in.